Welcome to Intro to Logic. The topic of this video is negation and double negation. Let's get started. In formal logic, we use the negation symbol, often represented with a tilde, to stand for the word not. So for example, the sentence, I eat pizza, can be represented with the letter P, and the negation of the sentence, I eat pizza, which is, I did not eat pizza, can be represented with the not P, or tilde P. Consider another example. Number one, I own a dog, and we can represent this with the letter D. And the negation of number one, I do not own a dog, can be represented with tilde D. It's not the case that I own a dog. Keep in mind that the negation of a sentence is the original sentence plus a new negation in front of that sentence. So for instance, the sentence S, when negated, is not S. And the negation of not Q is not not Q. Notice that sentences that begin with a negation, like not Q, have to add on another negation before the not Q. So we end up with a double negation as a result. Let's do a couple more examples. The negation of the sentence R is not R. The negation of the sentence M is not M. The negation of not L is not not L. Double negation is technically called a rule of replacement. According to double negation, we can add or take away any two negation signs from a sentence or a component of that sentence. So for example, if I have the sentence P as my first premise, double negation allows me to use the first premise to get not not P. And we'd write one DN. And this would be the rule that we used, double negation and the line. Another example, if we start with not not Q as our assumption. Double negation allows us to derive Q from line 1 and DN. Similarly, if we start with not T as our assumption, double negation allows us to derive not 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 T from 1. Double negation gets a little bit trickier when we face conditionals. Consider the conditional if P then Q as our first assumption. According to double negation, we can either negate or double negate the whole sentence, the whole conditional, and get not not if P then Q from line one DN. But similarly, we can also just double negate one of the sentential components of the first premise or the conditional. So from line one, we can derive if not not P, then Q, one DN. And similarly, we can derive from line one, if P, then not not Q, one DN. So this is a little bit trickier than our regular or simple sen sentences that we just looked at, but it's not too difficult once you get the hang of it. Just keep in mind that double negation allows us to take any P and derive not not P, and vice versa. And that includes a whole sentence or a whole conditional or the components of that sentence. Now that we've learned several rules of inference, let's try using them in a practice problem. When writing the practice problem, I will write it into sequent form using a bracket to separate the conclusion on the right hand side and the premises on the left hand side. The premises in this case are going to be it's not the case that if P then Q then S and not 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 if P then Q and the conclusion will be S. 
So let's try working this problem out. The first thing that we're going to do when writing a formal argument is draw a scope line. And then you want to write your premises or assumptions that you're already given, which happen to be on the left-hand side of this bracket. So the first assumption is going to be, it's not the case that if P, then Q, then S. And the second premise is not, 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 if P, then Q. The next thing we're going to do is write our conclusion at the bottom. In this case, the conclusion is S. The reason that we do this is that writing the conclusion kind of gives us some direction of where we're trying to get. Um, notice that the only place that we see S other than the conclusion is up here in the conditional. And since the only rule we've really learned this far um, that involves the conditional is modus ponens, we're probably going to have to do some type of modus ponens. So having the conclusion down at the bottom really gives us some direction for um, where we're going and maybe how we could work backwards to finding that conclusion. And that's going to be really handy as we move along to more complicated problems. Okay, so using premise 1 and 2, we have to ask ourselves, how can we infer some further line? And since there's nothing we can really do with line 1, given the rules we've learned so far, we're probably going to have to look to line 2. Now we just learned about double negation, which says that we can either add or take away two negation signs. Since premise 2 already has three negation signs, it's worth a try to take away two of them. So use, using line 2, let's write not if p then q. And that's 2 with rule double negation, or dn. Now that we have not if p then q, we have to ask ourselves if there's anything we can do with that line. Now, this is a little bit tricky. We haven't seen um, a negation sign in front of parentheses like this before. And it's important to keep in mind that not the case, or it's not the case that if P then Q is not identical to not P then Q. Uh, the first one says it's not the case that if P then Q. The negation goes over or extends over the whole parentheses, everything that's in here. Whereas in this case, the negation only extends over the P. Take a moment to understand the difference between it's not the case that if P then Q and if not P then Q. According to the first reading, we have the negation of the entire sentence if P then Q. And according to the second reading, we have only the negation of P as the antecedent and then the rest is just then Q. So there's no negation over the con the consequent, which in this case is Q. So let's define P as I get enough sleep and Q as I talk in class. For the first sentence we have it's not the case that if P then Q. And if we plug in these these definitions for P and Q, we get it is not the case that if I get enough sleep, I talk in class. So let's read that out loud one more time. Interpreting this sentence, we get, it's not the case that if I get enough sleep, I talk in class. So getting enough sleep does not give you the ability, according to the sentence, to talk in class. Now let's try the second sentence. Using the same definitions of P and Q, let's interpret what the sentence, if not P, then Q, would amount to. Using that definition of P and Q, Using the definitions of P and Q, we would get if I don't get enough sleep, then I talk in class. So according to this example, 
Whenever you don't get enough sleep, you talk in class. So not getting enough sleep is what is one of the ways you talk in class or one of the reasons you may talk in class. And recall that with our last example, the sentence was, it, it's not the case that if I get enough sleep, I talk in class. So it says something very different from what we're saying right now. So um, using line three, we can actually input that into line one and use modus ponens to derive S, which in this case is the conclusion. So we write one, three, modus ponens. Notice that the antecedent for line one is it's not the case that if P then Q, and we happen to have that on line three. Um, here it's going to be really handy to keep in mind what exactly an antecedent is and what's a consequent. And since these two are the same, we can just input line three and out comes S.